We believe in the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. This one <laughs> is fascinating right. to me for a few reasons. Hello, and welcome to the Hello Saints podcast. My name is Jeff. I am a pastor in Utah exploring everything I can about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And on this episode of the podcast, I am joined by, for the first time, a fellow evangelical pastor. Yeah. Hey, I'm Kyle Mashears. I'm also a pastor in Utah, but I'm not a pastor from Utah. So that's what's different. That's right. Yeah. So you're <laughs> currently in Utah, right. but where do you pastor? Yeah. I pastor at a church in Mobile, Alabama, all the way at the bottom of the Gulf Coast. Okay. And in this video, we are going to have a conversation about the Latter-day Saint Articles of Faith. And it's going to be kind of interesting because we're familiar with these types of um, lists of beliefs but we also know that the beliefs that are going to be talked about are going to be a little bit unique, and we're going to kind of get into it and figure out where there's similarities, where there's differences, and just give our take from an evangelical perspective of the 13 Articles of Faith. Yeah, sounds good. So tell people a little bit about your interest in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where it started, and how you sort of interact and interface in that inner faith context. Yeah. So I don't have any Latter-day Saint history in my background. And the first time I kind of learned about the Latter-day Saint faith and tradition, I was a really little boy. And opening up the Book of Mormon, kind of like being told by my evangelical parents, like, don't have anything to do with that, was like, well, now mm -hmm. I've got to push the red button, right? And that birthed in me this interest to learn more about it. And as I was like gaining resources from kind of the evangelical tribe, and I was talking with Latter-day Saints and reading their literature, I kind of felt like there was a disconnect and that for a lot of times they were like talking past each other. Yeah. And so I just felt like I wanted to like occupy a space that was listening to and speaking with Latter-day Saints at like a scholarly level, like hearing them, understanding and respecting their scholarship and then offering in return, like maybe a traditional Christian perspective on that. Mm -hmm. So that led to um, my PhD, which was, uh, I wrote on LDS history and I'm currently finishing a book called 40 Questions About Mormonism, which is a charitable, like non-polemic, uh, traditional reading of LDS faith and tradition. Yeah, and I, that was one of the things that really resonated with me when we met, because you are very much so wanting to move into a space, m academically, scholarly, that typically there's actually not a ton of current dialogue right now anyway on this. You know, I think maybe years ago, decades ago, especially when uh, Richard Mao, Craig Bloomberg, and some of those guys were interacting with people from BYU, writing books like How Wide the Divide. That was still 20, 30 years ago. And currently, there's not a whole lot of dialogue taking place in that scholarly realm between evangelicals and Latter-day Saints. Right. And so what I'm doing is I'm definitely you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. When that conversation was going, it was making a lot of headway and a lot of understanding, clarification, um, but it, it has kind of tapered off, and it's not anybody's fault in particular. It's just after you do that for 20 years, you know, yeah. time moves on. And so, um, yeah, I, I felt the, the, the kind of like prompting to stand up and enter that space and see what happens, and um, it's been wonderful. All right, so... That being the case, uh, I think it would be really fun and interesting for us to take a look at the 13 Articles of Faith that the church has had since essentially its beginning, right? Right, As right. far as you understand, this is from Joseph Smith. 1842. 1842, so just 12 years after the church was mm -hmm. established. Mm -hmm. And even enough time in there where there, there was probably some refinement of certain beliefs and positions on sure. things. This is almost, to me, uh, sort of a mix between not only certain beliefs, but almost just positions mm -hmm. on certain doctrinal issues, as mm -hmm. opposed to a comprehensive, this is everything we believe. Yeah. Does that seem accurate? It does, yeah. So I think maybe the historical context, too, will help understand why the things that are in it are in it, and why things that aren't in it are not. So Joseph Smith wrote this to a guy named John Wentworth, who was the editor of a newspaper called the Chicago Democrat. And mm -hmm. John actually had this letter arranged for another guy, and it was supposed to be in a publication of a book on like the history of New Hampshire. And because early Mormonism had a history in New Hampshire, he kind of wanted like, what are the basic beliefs of, of the Latter-day Saint tradition? Hmm. Well, it never made that book. It never made it into like the Chicago Democrat. 
But in March of 1842, Joseph Smith had it published in the Times and Seasons, which was a really influential and important newspaper at that time. In Nauvoo. In Nauvoo, yeah. And so this is for, for early Mormonism, which, you know, if you know the story, you would think would be like very anti-credal, right? Mm-hmm. So you have in the first vision with Joseph Smith that the Son of God says that all creeds are an abomination, and yet mm-hmm. here we have like a, a creed? What's going on? Uh, it's not a creed in the sense that like we would we would think of it, yeah. But it's more of like like you said, like it's the closest thing you can get to like a statement of faith. In fact, I think um, Dallin Oaks said that this was like the only formal declaration of our doctrine that's mm. made available to us. Yeah. And so it was um, it was canonized along with the Pearl of Great Price eventually, and it's a it's a it's a good go to to get kind of the core beliefs of the Latter Day Saint faith. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go through these one by one, uh, read probably a, a bit of an abridgment or just a, you know, the, the statement as it stands mm-hmm. without digging too much into the minutia. And then we'll also give a little bit of a comparison and contrast as to from a more traditional Protestant evangelical or biblical standpoint, whether there is agreement or disagreement or somewhere in between. Yeah, at a base minimum, it'd be interesting for some of your audience to see like how would a traditional Christian read this document like what are the because of the theological lenses that right. they're, they're reading this like how does it come across to them yeah, so, yeah. absolutely all right so you've got the original the original one version yeah. and mm-hmm. you were telling me that it's been tweaked a little bit but very you can very all, tiny you bit. can't tell you can't really tell just to yeah. modernize or clarify that's a couple it. things that's exactly right. so let's start with the first one here and i don't know if you want to read it sure if, maybe we could take turns yeah go for it <laughs> okay i'll go first yeah the first article is we believe in god the eternal father and in his son jesus christ and in the holy ghost okay so right off the bat, this would quite typically be a statement in most Protestant evangelical statements of faith. If it's not there, I'm concerned. Yeah, because exactly. this is this is pretty much like the you know hinges on which the Apostles' Creed yeah, came. Right? That's right, all of these elements. I believe God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ is only Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, those three things are there. Now, in some statements of faith, it might go a little further to clarify in Trinitarian form. Right which we don't see here no. for obvious reasons because mm-hmm. Latter-day Saints don't embrace the Trinity. So this is, in one sense, 100% in alignment with our belief in the Godhead mm-hmm. as the three persons of the Godhead. Yeah, and at a base minimum, God exists. Sure. So let's start, let's start yeah. there, like the yep. really basic commonality. And right? exists yep. in, in this three persons. triform yeah. Godhead. Yeah. 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 So what's not clear, though, about this text is um, what they mean by kind of the unity that we see in the plurality, where a traditional Trinitarian would say that God is three persons in one being, Latter-day Saint doctrine teaches that it's three persons in three separate beings. But part of one Godhead. But part of one Godhead, yeah. yeah. So that seems like, you know, splitting hairs, but at the end of the day, there's some really big differences. There. Right. So as it's stated, face value, it's like, okay, alignment. When you get a little bit further, I will say from a systematic theological perspective, just as where how we handle the full balance of what the Bible teaches about God and his mission and his heart and his will and all that stuff, the nature of God in his tr- Trinitarian form is about as foundational as you get right. for creedal Christianity. Yeah. So face value, very similar. As you drill into it, incredibly different. different. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and different in ways that deeply impact a lot of other beliefs. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's look at the second one here. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. All right. There's obviously a, I don't want to call it an agenda behind this, but this is, it seems almost like a response to what the vast majority of Protestant Christianity quite frequently teaches. Mm. And that is the conditional fallenness of mankind as it pertains to Adam's fallenness and how that leads to damnation. Yeah. So when I'm reading this statement, like I see the first part, absolutely agree. People incur divine punishment for their own sins. Mm-hmm. And then when it switches over to Adam's transgression, you're right. He's, he's speaking to something that's happening or that, that, you know, the doctrine of original sin yeah. is kind of what is the specter behind this article of faith. Right. So really the questions that are being asked here are, are we sinners because we sin, or do we sin because we're sinners? Mm-hmm. Like, do we sin and then gain a fallen nature, or are we born with a fallen nature, and that's why we sin? Right. And uh, what we would say as traditional 
evangelical Christians is the reason people sin is because of Adam's transgression. It's because of our condition right. of original sin right. that traces back to Adam. So it is both conditionally and behaviorally a yes. problem. Yeah, yeah. So the way I would say it is like, while it's true we aren't punished for Adam's transgression, we are still punished because of Adam's transgression. Right. Because he messed it all up. Right. right? And we're born into that fallen, right. fallen, fallenness. That's right. And we do see Jesus as sort of the new Adam. Right. 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 Now, yep. not, they're not the same being. That gets into no. another, could be confusing belief in the history of the Latter-day Saint Church. Right. But we believe that Jesus, in a, a, type, a typological standpoint, mm-hmm. he is reversing the curse that Adam cause. Yeah, the, 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 the ancient church fathers called it recapitulation, reheading. So right. we were headed first by Adam who fell, and now God has reheaded humanity with Christ. Right, yeah. yeah. So we agree sin is a problem, right? but we disagree when it comes to that original sin concept. Right. Yeah. Right. All right, you want to read number three? Sure. Number three, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Okay. So, through the atonement of Christ, we're good. We're good. That's an exclusive statement about like the centrality and, and the, the primary and unique role that Christ has yes. for salvation. So, that is yep. right on point. And the yeah. full sufficient role That's right. that he yeah, carries. It's his cross alone. It's just I think it Colossians chapter 1, right? Exactly. So yeah. Just straight up. Yep. Um, that all mankind may be saved. Yes. We're on board. Yeah. John 3.16. John 3.16. Here we go. Right. There it is. Yep. Yeah. Now, by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Yes. This is where there's a lot of language that might sound familiar to a Protestant, mm-hmm. but we know that the definitions behind some of these get tied into more very specific esoteric doctrines tied to Latter-day Saint belief. Right. And so, to be fair to Joseph, this is you know not the medium to start listing out temple ceilings and endowments and right. all of these types of things. He does list the things that are of chief or primary importance in, for the ordinances in the next article— um, but for me, uh, as a as a traditional Christian, what I would say is we aren't saved by obedience or laws. We're saved for obedience mm. and yeah. laws, right? So it's not that we would say like good works have nothing to do with your salvation, um, but these are the results of salvation. Yeah. They come from... Yeah, and semantically, I've heard a lot of Latter-day Saints say that's what they believe or that's what they agree with, mm-hmm. that we we don't go to the temple in order to be saved, but because we are saved. Now, I, I think that that type of positioning and language might be a little bit newer mm. to the mindset of Latter-day Saints, because, yeah, this quite clearly says saved by obedience to the laws, and I like the way you just put it. It's not saved by, but for, but for obedience. Them, yeah. I mean, this yeah. is Romans chapter 12, mm-hmm. verses 1 and 2, talking about how you know we're being transformed yes. by the renewing of our mind, we're yep. being not conformed to this world, and that's tied to living lives of obedience and worship. It's mm-hmm. Another way that I usually put it is, we obey not in order to, but because. Yeah, that's good. So, so at the end of the day, um, maybe, maybe even let's give Joseph the benefit of doubt here. The word by the by the word by can mean something different. It's it's been hundreds hundreds of years since he used it. So, if he meant something along the lines of like saved unto or saved for good works, then we would have a lot more agreement. Right? Sure. So that's Ephesians two eight through ten. But if he meant saved by yeah. these works, then no, that's where there's going to be a difference. Where, yeah. I mean, that really gets back to the roots of the Reformation. Exactly. Are we justified by faith? Or are we justified by works? Yeah, sola fide. Here we are. There yeah. we are. Yeah. One of the solas is going right. to pop up It's going to pop up. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. I think, is it my turn? It's your turn. It okay. Yeah. Number four says, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, fourth, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's not a whole lot here that, again, at face value, I would disagree with. Mm -hmm. Um, There is actually in systematic theology, which is, for Latter-day Saints who might not be familiar with what that is, that's essentially the way that Protestants, and I think even Catholics practice this as well, just a a comprehensive um, listing out of not just what the Bible teaches, but how it all interconnects. Mm-hmm. That's why the, the systematic part. So it's typically, you know, the doctrines of the Bible, of God, of salvation, of Jesus. And within that doctrine of salvation, there's something called an order of salvation. Mm-hmm. What happens when, how did, like, is, is, does repentance precede 
regeneration or does regeneration precede repentance? And there's a little bit of not debate, but different schools of thinking there. Mm -hmm. But this seems like an attempt to clarify there is an order of salvation right. when it comes to first faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second repentance, third baptism, fourth receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yes. And and it's important here because with faith being primary mm -hmm. and then repentance being secondary, that's the right order. I would because agree. Because for you to, re to, to repent means to turn away from something. You're not going to turn away from the world if you don't trust Christ. Right. So the trust of Christ has to be present first for you to be able to turn to Him. That's right. And, and that's the order that we see here. Yeah. So I definitely thumbs up yeah. for this. I affirm it. All the promises of God are yes in Him. Amen. You need to believe that first, and then you will That's repent. right. Yeah. yeah. So baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. That's something that is why they held across all of Christianity. Yes, but... But it's also <laughs> one of the most difficult I have found, not just an interfaith conversation, an interdenominational conversation. Mm -hmm. Baptism is the hardest conversation to have yes. because there are so many different views, specifically when you get down into regenerational baptism, or is, is baptism regenerational? Does it actually, and, and we'll talk about that in the uh, this Articles of Faith, yeah. it re removes sin, right. Does it yeah. actually remove yeah. sin? Does it actually remove sin? But yes, we do believe in baptism across mm -hmm. the board. There's not a Protestant denomination that doesn't believe in baptism, right? other than, actually there is one. <laughs> Well, in, in history too, the Quakers are Shakers, I think. The Quakers. The Quakers did. Yeah, they, right. they, re they rejected, they rejected all about ordinances. Baptism because it was, of the Holy Ghost. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, and then fourth of all, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, regardless of how, I know that for you and I in the Protestant world, we we might press in there a little bit because of how people define the Holy Ghost, right. how it's manifested, yeah. how s there's s uh, the, the fruit of the Holy Ghost being present. Um, but I think... If we're just going to look at this at face value, we do believe that when someone is uh, born again, they are born again by the Spirit of God. Right. And we do receive the Holy Ghost as we see in Acts chapters 1 through 2. Yeah. And that's John 3. That's the promise Jesus gives of the that's Holy right. Spirit coming and regenerating you and being born again. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. Number five. Go okay. for it. We believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by laying on of hands by those who are in authority to preach the gospel and administer in the ordinances thereof. Now, here's one small tweak. Yeah. In your version, do you have quotes around prophecy by laying on of hands? I do not. In the original, it does. Okay. And that's because Joseph Smith is uh, riffing off of 1 Timothy 4.14, where he asks Timothy not to neglect the gift that was given to him by prophecy and by the laying on of hands. Mm. But if you look at your modern edition, um, I don't think that's present. Is that no, true? It's not. Yeah. yeah. So I just thought that was an important note. This is where... Joseph is drawing that language from. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. So I think that it is it is pretty obvious here, especially those who are familiar with Latter-day Saint belief, that this is really now getting into this uh, very distinctive quality that's held by the church mm -hmm. of sort of a lineage of prophetic voice, um, not necessarily from a genealogical standpoint, but just from how it cascades down through the church, the laying on of hands of those in authority. So this now we're getting into areas of priesthood mm -hmm. and to preach the gospel and administer in the ordinances thereof. Now, when we hear ordinances, we most oftentimes think of baptism and communion. Just the two. Just the two. Whereas in a Latter-day Saint context, we're talking about a whole array of ordinances primarily done in the temple, not all of them, but there's a lot packed in this one statement. Yes, yeah, a ton. One thing I wanted to draw our attention to is that he says, we believe a man must be called of God. And that is something that like we would share yes. with Latter-day Saints. And you look at the Bible, it's Moses, well, before him, Abraham, Moses, Samuel, the disciples, Saul. Mm -hmm. um, nobody just gets to stand up and raise their hand and then say to themselves, like, I'm a leader now because I want to be, right. and then gather a movement around him. Like, you have to be called by God. Yeah. And that has to be recognized by a local church and affirmed by right. the local church. And I will say this is where the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does things really well in clarifying how that calling takes place and who affirms that calling mm. and the authority over that, whereas it, it can get a little out of control in the Protestant world oh, yeah. where someone is claiming a certain authority outside of the existing authority and they don't submit to that authoritative process and they go rogue or they do their own thing. Yeah. Um, it doesn't happen as much 
as people might think, but it definitely happens. It mm-hmm. is not uncommon. Yeah, and it's happened throughout the history of the LDS Church too. So I think to me that speaks more of like a human heart condition yeah, than it does true. anything. Yeah, and that was one thing that I was really surprised by whenever I started this journey. About six months in, I was in Independence, Missouri, mm-hmm. with a mutual yeah. friend, Stephen Pinecker. Mm-hmm. And my eyes were open that there are dozens and dozens, actually more than dozens, in the hundreds. Like there are a lot of different groups out there mm-hmm. that claim to be the, the proper authoritative line. Right of Joseph Smith, but obviously the church that exists centralized in Salt Lake City is the one that has the largest movement. Right. Well, you're up. All right. Number six, we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, namely apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth. Yes. So I like the original version better. We believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, the vis-a-vis. Oh, very you got to get a good vis-a-vis in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they changed it to namely because vis-a-vis yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. it definitely sounds more sophisticated right. your way. So. so here they are, primitive church. What are the offices? Who's doing what and why? That's kind yeah. of what Joseph's bringing up here. And, and yeah. when it says primitive church, is that what we would just call like the first century church? The New Testament church. The New Testament the church. The original yeah. or early church. Yeah. The yeah. church in Acts. The church in Acts. As we yes. commonly say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I ask that is because as I have read through the Book of Mormon, there is a church present hundreds of years before the New Testament right. church. But when it comes to these specific offices, apostles, prophets, pastors, that seems like a pretty clear echoing of 1 Corinthians. These are all terms from the New Testament. Which Paul yes. is, is referring to. So yeah, yeah. if I were to uh, look at this at face value, it seems to me, yeah, that this the primitive church is talking about the church that Christ established through the conversation he had with Peter, Mm -hmm. even though there was a form of assembly or church that existed in the Book of Mormon. Right, in the New World. In the New World. Yeah. yeah. That's right. All right, number seven. We believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. This one (laughs) is fascinating to me. Yeah. For a few reasons. First of all, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Okay. And for those who aren't familiar with what a Pentecostal church is, they are more on the spectrum of believing that the gifts that the Holy Spirit manifested, beginning in Acts chapter two, speaking in tongues and some of that other things, continue to this day. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of Protestant churches that believe in what's called cessationism, where those things ceased at the end of the apostolic age. But the Assemblies of God is a church that I was a part of for a while. I'm no longer, but they talk very specifically about the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. And I didn't know that that was even in the mindset of anyone before the Pentecostal revivals of the early 20th century. Now, I knew that there were some occurrences of this in the First and Second Great Awakening, but I I have to imagine that this has to come from that, right? Like the Second Great Awakening, there were certain manifestations taking place. And so tongues would have been active, or at least on the mind of Joseph at the time that he was establishing the church. Absolutely. And we have a lot of evidence to suggest that they were speaking in tongues, whether that was in their church gatherings or even privately. I mean, it was so integrated into early Latter-day Saint tradition that I've read like journal accounts where members were talking about like a mundane day where they woke up early, they went to the garden, they plucked carrots out, they tended to their children, they met with people, spoke in tongues, and they went to bed. And you're yeah. like, you did, back up just <laughs> Hold on a second. What did you, what? <laughs> yeah, is this a, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it was very integrated for them. And so what did they mean by speaking in tongues? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's the same thing that we would consider in speaking in tongues today, like post Azusa Street Revival, which was I a really know. important moment in the charismatic movement. Very but much so. I, still, they believe I, it. I, yeah. I think... I think it was tongues in that sense, only because I read a biography on Brigham Young. Mm -hmm. He was like one of the most speaking in tongues guys out there. In fact, I think, I could be wrong here. I think at one point, Joseph was like, taper back a little bit. Like Joseph was wanting to kind of pull back in the whole area of tongues where Brigham was very comfortable in it. Interesting. And we know him to be a more charismatic guy anyway. And he was also a big dancer, which is, uh, he just, he was very expressive, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's actually legend that whenever Brigham was in Salt Lake Valley, that he at least one time communicated 
with Native Americans speaking in tongues. Oh, wow. I didn't, and they I could understand that. what he was saying. Now, wow. that's a legend. I don't know how, how yeah. much it's been verified. But the presence of tongues, not only in an article of faith, but even in the practice of Latter-day Saints, was something I did not see coming when I first started looking into all of this. It's fascinating. All right, number eight. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Okay. Obviously, that first line checks out. Yeah, let's start with the Bible's God's Word, and it's supposed to be believed. Yep. Yes. Totally agree. Perfect. Yep. As far as it is translated correctly, I would actually say I half agree with that. Yes, I do too. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, because there are bad translations of the Bible. There are. Yeah. But but let's talk a little bit for a second before we get into the, the latter part of this statement. Why are we so confident that the translations that we have are reliable, are trustworthy? I think it actually has to do with the word translated here in the text, Mm -hmm. which possibly to Joseph and his contemporaries meant something more of like what we would be familiar with, transmitted. Okay. So how did we go from originals to copies to copies to copies to copies? Yes. And one of the chief concerns that Joseph had was that there were scribes, whether intentionally or with, you know, bad intent, changing doctrines, and as the Book of Mormon says, stripping away plain and precious truths, right? which is why the Book of Mormon needs to come in to the picture and why I think here it's paired with the Bible. Which all of this also being tied to the belief in the great apostasy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So for Joseph Smith to know what we know today about like specifically like New Testament textual transmission, um, if he if he knew what we knew today, I don't know if he would have taken such a strong position because yeah. as far as an ancient document is concerned, uh, New Testament studies is has an embarrassingly rich amount of evidence to suggest that yeah. what we have today is a is a faithful transmission of what right. the early church had. Yeah. As a matter of fact, in a counterintuitive way, we actually treasure the fact that there are so many manuscripts mm-hmm that there are so many variants. We have so many data points to look at to figure out what are outliers, what the variants actually are versus what the original text was saying. Right. Now, if you only had two to compare, you're always looking at, well, which one has a variant, which one doesn't, even in three. And you, you do your best to kind of figure out, well, I guess between these two agree and that one doesn't agree. Now you put that into 15,000 or 20,000, however many manuscripts we have in the New Testament specifically, we, we do feel a great deal of confidence, even with other external evidences beyond just the textual uh, look at it, that we feel they're pretty strongly that they, they are translated correctly. Yeah, it's, it's commonly told to me that the Bible was like a game of telephone. And as one messenger passes the messenger to the other, and then the previous one dies, or in this analogy, like the, the manuscripts are lost, and we have really no clue what message we have today is what we had yesterday. But because of the amount of evidence that we have, I think it's more appropriate to think of it as like a game or a three-dimensional puzzle, Mm. where you're kind of like looking through layers throughout time Mm -hmm. to see which ones match and which ones don't. Yeah, absolutely. And to that point, we also have the benefit of incredibly educated, not just linguists, but also archaeologists. Mm-hmm. Then you add in the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm-hmm. And yes. I don't want to just make this a, yeah, yeah. an apologetics well, yeah. on bibliography, but well, that's really important to yeah, us. Yeah, and, and I, don't think, I don't think it necessarily has to be. It, it, it's something that like Latter-day Saints could get excited about too, because we share the New Testament together yeah. as faith communities. And so you should be stoked to know that Absolutely. the New Testament, what it speaks to you, it is speaking to you as the Word of God. Right. Yeah. And and I'll even press further into that because I'll talk to Latter-day Saints. Uh, let's just pick an issue. Let's talk about marriage. And, you know, whenever we in the evangelical world who hold to sola scripture, we believe in the authority of the word of God. If somebody is out of line or outside of that, we will take them the Bible and say, this is what the scriptures say. Mm. Like you need to reconcile how you're living or what you believe to what God has revealed, right? If you do that with a Latter-day Saint, I'll go back to marriage and say, hey, Paul says it is better for a man not to be married, right? Mm -hmm. And you guys put so much focus on ceilings in the temple. What do you say about that? A Latter-day Saint can believe that that is a 100% accurate translation of the New Testament and say, we believe that Paul said that and that he believed it and that he taught it. But we have 
ongoing revelation. Right. Exactly. We have additional scriptures right. that yeah. give greater clarification and maybe even a renewed emphasis on something mm -hmm. that Paul didn't have an emphasis on. Mm -hmm. So there's not it is not even necessary because of the embracing of ongoing revelation for Latter-day Saints to say, because we can't trust right. the way the Bible has been right. translated. Right. We kind of neglected yeah. the Book of Mormon, didn't we? Oh, <laughs> sorry, we should probably go back to that. So we both love the Bible. Yeah. So we're talking about the Bible. It, it like eclipses everything. <laughs> but here, go right past we the also Book of say we believe in the Book of Mormon. Uh, or to specifically the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Yeah. So uh, the Book of Mormon is included along with the Bible as the Word of God. So why would we disagree with that? Well, uh, I have two. I have a question and a comment to that. Okay. So the question is, why at this point, if this was 1842, is also the doc Doctrine and Covenants not included? The in doctrine, yeah, the Doctrine and Covenants has been published in like an earlier form, but mm -hmm. because Joseph's alive, alive, you still have continuing revelation. Okay. So there are versions, like the Book of Commandments had been published uh, much earlier, and then you have like the a doc another Doctrine and Covenants version coming out very shortly in like mm. 1844. So for them, I think like D&C is in, in flux at okay. the moment. It could be attitude. They don't know Joseph's going to die in two years. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and as far as embracing the Book of Mormon, I mean, we quite clearly, and I think it's commonly known, that we believe that the books of the Bible that are currently canonized um, were not determined in the 300s, right. like some people might uh, state, but they were actually widely used in a lot of ways that we're even talking about some of these manuscripts. We, we know which books were being used in the apostolic age that gives us a great deal of confidence in which books are inspired versus which books are outside of inspiration or they're Gnostic in some sense. So uh, as a result of the Book of Mormon lying so far outside of that, not just in its textual sense, but even in its historic claims makes the Book of Mormon nowhere near the thought process of mainstream Christianity. You said a word, canon, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's a really important word for us. Canon comes from the Greek word canon, just spelled with a K, which mm -hmm. means like measuring rod or measuring stick. And right. so for the early Christians, um, when they were not deciding what books go in the Bible, but discerning by the Spirit which books go in the Bible, uh, canon was a helpful analogy for like, a, a, you know, a foot long, mm -hmm. right? For us, if the Bible is supposed to be a foot long, it can't be a foot long and an inch because mm -hmm. it's no longer a foot long. Right. So when people say like, well, you believe the canon is closed, it, that's true, but I, I don't know if that's as helpful language because it implies that I don't believe God still speaks today. Which is, which not, is true. not true. In our context, it's not God true. is clearly right. actively speaking. Right. But I would say the, the canon is not closed, but it is fixed. I think that that is an incredibly important point yeah. because... To just to echo what we just said, we believe God is still speaking today quite right. clearly. Yes. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is on the level of you of authority that can override Scripture. Mm -hmm. Contrary to that, we believe that anything that we believe God is revealing, our rallying point, our measuring rod, is to go back to, does this line up to what we know to be inspired revelation? Right. right. Yeah. So what are some of the ways that we believe God is still speaking? All right. Personally. Mm -hmm. through prayer. Mm -hmm. um, we do believe uh, in like subjective, personal, religious experience, and that might surprise some yeah. Latter-day Saints to, to hear and that. And the activity of the Holy the Spirit activity in the, the Holy daily Spirit, life yeah. of an individual. It speaks to us through uh, our community, the, the saints or Christians around us, mm -hmm. but he speaks to us, I think, as a Protestant, primarily through the proclamation of the gospel and God's word, just being reminded of that. Paul yeah. says so often, I remind you, therefore, brothers and sisters, yeah. of what was delivered to you first. And so... Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's still speaking today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, number nine. We believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's kind of related a little bit to our yep. conversation that we've been having already. On, on obviously, the word that's being used there, revelation. Um, again, at face value, we would agree with all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, we believe that God is the arbiter of all that is true. He is the the uh, alpha and the omega of reality, mm -hmm. and anything that is and that he has proclaimed and that he has spoken into existence is tied to the purity of who he is. I know we're starting to get a little bit philosophical and existential there, but we believe truth comes from him, mm -hmm. and that he has revealed, he is now still revealing. We believe there are many things that have yet to be revealed. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the book of Revelation— 
it's uh, the revelation, an ongoing revelation of who Jesus is and in a somewhat veiled sense, what that's going to look like in an end time or an eschatological sense. So I think that we would agree with all of this, though I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this is a proclamation about, more specifically, ongoing revelation within the Latter-day Saints. Right, within the prophetic office. Within the prophetic yeah, office. Yeah, yeah. Or, or more than that, like personal revelation that sure. Latter-day Saints can, can receive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we would say, I echo all that, you know, God has already spoken in in many ways, right? Mm-hmm. That's Hebrews, Hebrews one. Hebrews one, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, he's spoken in in a, in a final sense through His Son, through the proclamation of the gospel and His victorious resurrection. He's promised things to come. You can also incorporate, I think, things like Psalm nineteen, um, which mm-hmm. which holds into two kinds of revelation that God gives: one of His created order, the beauty and the mm-hmm. the the wonder of creation, which we call and general revelation. general revelation, mm-hmm. and then what we call special revelation, which mm-hmm. would be like His law. Scripture, the Prophetic gospel, voice. those types of things. So, God does still now reveal things to us through those things. Um, but if we're talking about what God reveals to us, it always has to come back to error checking and cross referencing against Scripture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, because he he will not go beyond or contradict what he's already That's said. Right. He he can't lie. Right. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Right. And in his holiness, even though he is immutable in one sense and interactable on another sense when it comes to truth he's not changing what is holy versus what isn't holy what is right versus what is wrong like there is a a constant rallying point like i think i used earlier that we can go to and trust that we need to always be discerning we we have a clear place where we can discern anything that we claim to be being revealed and the only other thing here in number 9 that we haven't touched on is important things pertaining to the kingdom of god we do believe that Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God. And, and I think that um, though even from a standpoint of what eternity looks like, we believe from an agenda standpoint, Jesus brought the kingdom of God. It's what he announced, it's what he inaugurated, and it's what will be consummated at the end of all things. So we, we believe that that is an important element there as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, and how exactly is that going to happen? The next article kind of... Okay. Tips a tips a card a bit and into the what we would call the eschatology or the end times thought of yeah. Joseph Smith. Well, let's look okay. at it then. Okay. Number ten. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. There's a lot here. <laughs> yep. And in the restoration of the ten tribes, that Zion, in parentheses, the New Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. I, I think the best way to do this is actually to go backwards. Let's go backwards. So that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and received in this kind of paradisical glory. Yes. 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 100%. 100%. I mean, that is the primary future Christian hope. That's Revelation chapters 21 and 22. It is the new heavens. Yes. It is the new earth. We're good there. 100% good there. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's... Back up one more sentence. Okay. That, that Zion, so mine's a little bit different. This is the old version. That Zion will be built upon this continent. And then later, uh, the church clarified that Zion or the New Jerusalem would be built upon this continent, i.e. America. America. Yeah. No. No. We don't, we don't, don't believe that. I don't believe that. No. We believe that the, the consummation of God's covenants to Israel clearly, geographically and historically, point to... Jerusalem Mm -hmm. points to Israel, Mm -hmm. and maybe a a clear way to say it is we don't believe that when it comes to the geography of Zion in the last days is tied to this continent. Correct. And I'd go even further than that. The geography is not the point. Yes. The the kingdom of God that's coming is the the bridegroom receiving his bride. So it's the people that's the most important thing. And I I think Latter day Saints would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Um, But for us, I think it personally helps like prioritizing when we're dealing with eschatology or end times, what are we putting more emotional or what are we putting our hope in more? Mm-hmm. That there would be a literal gathering of a people or that Jesus is coming back to redeem us. Right. And and I will say, we do get caught up in that whole thing All within our context as well, All right? All the time. Because once you yep. get into a millennial reign, mm-hmm. premillennial, amillennial. Rapture. Rapture, all, of all those yep. things. Yep. Um, it, it, things can get 
pretty distinct when it comes to the convictions people have of what the Bible teaches there. Yeah. And I could talk about that for a long time, but we don't have to right now. Yeah. So kind of like baptism and yes, big, exactly. big rabbit trail. So the, the first line then is the belief in a literal gathering of Israel and the restoration of the 10 tribes. Right. So shorthand for the, you know, ethnic Jews are going to be gathered back into Israel and the restoration of the 10 tribes, I think that's shorthand for the Nephites, yes. the Lamanites, or the descendants, I should say, of Lehi. Right. In this in this context. Which obviously is not a narrative embraced by mainstream Christianity. Right. Now when it comes to the the literal gathering of Israel, again, in our context, there are very passionate beliefs in that area. Yes. Um I probably the two main categories, you can correct me if I'm wrong, where people will uh, discuss this is in a dispensational view, mm -hmm. which is gonna put more of an emphasis on God fulfilling all of his promises to the ethnic group of Israel versus a more covenantal view that might even get into what we would call replacement theology, that the church has actually replaced Israel in a sense that whatever God promised to fulfill to Israel will actually be fulfilled through the church. Yeah, but the 100% the, uh, agreed. I think what would unify both of those polar extremes, and there's a bunch of views that are nuanced to oblivion. Yes, because there there's a, at least a dozen dispensational yeah. views. The one thing that all tr traditional Christians should agree on is the fact that the gospel is making a new people by faith in Abraham that is both Jew and Gentile. 100%. Like, that's what you have to yeah. agree on or yeah. what's Paul talking about in Romans. That's right. Right? Yep. So, and this is uh, just a little aside. We'll mm -hmm. just take a little little tributary and get back on, on track here. These issues that we're talking about here, we're, we're saying there's a lot of different differing beliefs here. Um, we're comfortable with people having different beliefs there. Yes. That doesn't disqualify someone's That's correct. salvation. They don't have to adhere to a covenantal or dispensational view. There can be varying views on how Israel is handled in the last days. And I think you're bringing it to a more important point, and that is that God keeps his promises to his people mm -hmm. and will make all things right and all things new at the end of the day. That's, That's right. where we, we agree. That's right. Yep, 100%. Yeah. All right, next one. All right, number 11. I don't have the numbers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just have the text for all that. Right, no, number 11. So okay, all right. We claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our conscience and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. There's a lot here, not only that is doctrinally fascinating, but also historically uh, y yes. interesting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How, how many years after Liberty Jail... Yeah. Has it been since he wrote this? I mean, he's still probably, he's probably a little bit cold. Yeah, absolutely. From that winter. He's still yeah. got... And here he is advocating, without question, li religious liberty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which is admirable. Very admirable. Yeah. When I read this, I'm, I'm reading a, a, like a Protestant doctrine of soul competency, like the, mm -hmm. the belief that each individual is accountable to God by themselves. Yes. Therefore, no one, not your neighbor, not your spouse, not your government, can force upon you a, a worldview, be it religious or non-religious, to to conform you to their right. essentially like to make to conform conform them to your image and what you want them mm. to believe. Yeah, and I think what's happening here is Joseph's rejecting that, mm -hmm. uh, especially being in Nauvoo. I found an interesting uh, historical tidbit here that in Nauvoo around this period of time, there was a $500 fine and six months in jail punishment if you, quote, ridiculed, abused, or otherwise depreciated another in consequence of his religion. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that would have been a lot of money back then. A lot of money back then. So he was wow. very serious about religious liberty. And I think some of this ties to, from what I understand, Latter-day Saint belief, their principles, they, they tie the development and the clarification of their doctrines to almost the framers of the Constitution, in a sense. They're very influenced by the American way, believing that God was heavily involved in establishing the principles and the freedoms and the rights that were established in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So being that America was established on freedom of religion, um, they're tipping their cap to that. Yeah, not surprised that it's in here. Yeah. yeah. All, All right. right, two more. Okay, we believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. Yes. yes. 100%. This is basically 100%. just Paul and Peter. And Paul, Jesus. And Jesus. Render right. under exactly. Caesar, so right? let's like, render unto Caesar what Caesar is. Let every soul be subject to yep. authority or the higher powers, and then honor all men, honor the king. Yep. Like, that is Jesus, Paul, Peter. Yep. Done. And honestly, we could just be done and move on, 
But just since we didn't spend a ton of time here, let's just talk a little bit. This is where there can be tension in America right, right now. Right, exactly. Because yeah. yep. there there is this righteous indignation that exists for whatever the reason is, whether it's your political party, social issues, candidate, that we should be in some way being anti-establishment. Mm-hmm. And I would say that a large majority of Bible-believing Protestant evangelicals in, in America would say, we need to we need to chill mm-hmm. and not be such a disruptive force. Like we're we're definitely being pressed on certain issues of morality and social issues, mm-hmm. but we're doing pretty good here in America when it comes to our uh, freedom to worship, yes, to share the gospel, to worship and function freely. So, so this is one that with like a full hearted agreement can say yes to. Agreed, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. All right, All right, right last, last one. Last one. We believe in being honest. True, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and in doing good to all men. Well, your stops there? Yes. Oh, what does your say? Mine's got a whole other like paragraph. Oh, oh, is this uh, Philippians 4, 8? Well, uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, uh, so, after so, so just to, to, to remind us, I'm reading the original 1842 version, and you're reading um, uh, an updated. The, the, the updated version. So this says, and in doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. So I think I see, I yeah. see. We believe all things, we hope all things, we have endured many things and hope to be able to endure all things. If there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. So yep, this yeah. is Philippians. Philippians 4. I will say <laughs> that this morning as I was praying, I was praying this over my family. Well, there you go. So yep. like when it comes to that scriptural reference there, uh, 100% in alignment yeah. there. Yeah. And the context of it, or the backdrop here, that as individuals, we should have integrity, we should have character that is honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, doing good to all men. Uh, totally agree with all that. Yeah, I would go so far as to say, like, if you don't agree with this, there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Almost in any religious context, or even just civil context, right? right? right. Yep. Yeah, so I think that this is good because, um, and I'm, I'm totally assuming here, but whereas in you know, the 1830s, Latter-day Saints are being driven out. They're being called all kinds of names. They're being uh, mistreated. Rights are being taken away. There's extermination orders going on. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is where the myth came up that Latter-day Saints have horns. Mm -hmm. Like whatever it may be, he's saying, we're not going to fight fire with fire. Right. This is not eye for an eye. This is not tooth for a tooth. The clear call of the scriptures, specifically the New Testament, is that we we are to be god honoring people and peacemakers and yeah. it should mm-hmm. translate into our relationships with others yes yeah yeah which yeah. is saying a lot especially in 1842 for them in their context to your point earlier yep. after joseph smith has endured what he did right in kirtland and in missouri right and in some part up to this point also in nauvoo i mean he had people hunting him in nauvoo mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. so yeah i think that this is a one that we would agree with yeah and it's a good one to end on it's a great one to end on yeah. now as we get to the end of this it's sort of highlights what we said earlier, mm-hmm. and that is, this doesn't to me seem like a statement of faith as I'm used to it. Right. Because in the statements of faith in an evangelical or in a Protestant world, we talk about God, the nature of God, scriptures, Jesus, his character, his mission, the ordinances, what is the church. Um, we talk about eschatology and how things end. Like we, It's a full spectrum of of those beliefs, mm-hmm. whereas this is leaving out certain beliefs as it pertains to uh, heaven mm-hmm. and the belief of even the, the pre-mortal existence isn't really referred to. And there's no priesthood. There's no priesthood. And proxy baptism. Proxy baptism, all that yeah. stuff. So uh, I just find that interesting. And it's um, maybe from my vantage point, it makes me wonder, is it because those things aren't foundational? Or is it just that at the time that he wrote these 13 articles, um, these were the ones that he felt were more priority. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell. I mean, I think one of the only contextual clues that you get from history is that he was writing this for a largely non Latter day Saint audience. Mm. So this was for public consumption and it was meant to be a basic introduction to Latter day Saint beliefs. Mm-hmm. So for me, from like a charitable perspective, I'm going to say, even as an evangelical, if I sit down with the latter saying, I'm not going to overload you with all the specifics. Mm-hmm. I am going to look at the Grand Canyon from the 30,000 foot view. Right. And if you want to, we can pack a bag and go hiking later. Yes. Um, but to your point, there's a lot of like dynamic doctrines and practices that are de- being developed 
at the same time that he's writing them. Yeah. So maybe he just didn't feel like they were um, solidified enough as mm-hmm. they are today and didn't feel like they can go in there. Or maybe he's not quite sure that he wants this to be public yet. So from a charitable perspective, it's it's like immature in his mind or he's still receiving revelation. From a critical perspective, it's kind of like, well, what are you hiding, buddy? Like, you yeah, know, right. why, why aren't you putting those things in there? So I, I, don't, I don't know the, the rationale, but probably if I'm giving the benefit of the doubt, it's, the, it's context dependent, it's audience dependent, and it's when he was writing. Yeah, and it does make me wonder, though, it makes me ask, if this was established so long ago, just a couple years before Joseph passed away, and so much has taken place since then, and they, this is a church that believes in ongoing revelation, I would think that this is a document that's regularly being updated. Mm. And I wonder if there is any talk at some point of updating... The 14th Yeah, adding a 14th or, or 15th yeah. or 16th, right? Yeah. Um, or freshening these up in a way to kind of integrate some of those more developed teachings. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think um, what's interesting is when the Pearl of Great Price was first published, it, it, it was meant to be like an introduction to, to the Latter-day Saint doctrines. And it had at the time what would have been considered at the time some of the more exotic doctrines, mm-hmm. like uh, you know the plurality of gods, for example, mm-hmm. which is what Book of Abraham is about. Um, and then it has the Articles of Faith, so it's kind of like this more mundane yeah. or very straightforward thing. Yeah, I, I still to this day I think I see the Articles of Faith as kind of representing the foundation for doctrine. Yeah, because if you if you crack away at this foundation, all of the other things like proxy baptism, ceilings in the temple, sure. Doctrine of eternal progression, they collapse. It's a great point. Yeah. 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 And and why I think it's important for those outside of the church, if you're wanting to understand the beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this is a good starting point. Yes. Yep. But these aren't necessarily the beliefs that are going to cause the most issues or the most recoiling mm-hmm. when it comes to a comparative look. It's that gets into some of those more specific doctrines that we're talking about. Yeah. And and again, like you you were saying earlier, like this is sort of like a confession of faith for like a Protestant denomination, but sort of not. And here's where it's the sort of not. Yeah. When it comes to like a, a Protestant confession of faith, that's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Like if you don't believe it, you're not whatever that right. church is. But for Latter day Saints, it's yes, it's true, this is it. You don't believe it, you're not Latter day Saint. And, and there's all these other things. And there's all these other things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think this is a really helpful conversation. Yeah. It's helpful for me to sit with not just a Latter-day Saint, which is what I typically do, but to sit with a fellow evangelical where there's a lot of alignment and also someone who's really informed with the broader understanding of Latter-day Saint belief and history and tradition. So this has been helpful for me. So thank you. Yeah, it was for, great. For joining I, me. I really and, loved it. Yeah. And, and talking through this with me and really excited about your book. Tell everybody about it one more time and when they can expect to see it released. Yeah, it's uh, 40 questions about uh, Mormonism. I'm actually turning in the manuscript to the uh, general editor next month. And so it should be due out by the end of the year or early next year. Fantastic. That's awesome. You're an important voice in this conversation, which is why I'm glad that we're talking and continuing to uh, just grow in relationship and be on this journey together and engage this people group that, as we talked about earlier, in some senses, um, it's much, it's overdue for us to be engaging mm. with them in a more intentional way. So really appreciate what you do. Yeah, thank you. Hope you liked this episode. Like the video if you're watching on YouTube. You can also subscribe if you're listening on podcasting platforms. Just follow us so that you get updates whenever new episodes drop. You can support me on Patreon if you'd like, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Just keep coming back for more videos, for more podcast episodes. And until next time, I'll see you later, saints.